is a rather special video. Not only has today's subject been voted on by my ever generous supporters on Patreon, but it also represents my contribution to Operation Odysseus, a massive collaborative project between myself and some 16 other history-based YouTube channels of a great variety, from the uh, concise and prolific armchair historian to the ever mimetic potential history, and well, just about everyone in between. Uh, we've all chosen our own topics within the wide range of naval history, from the ancient to the modern. So uh, if by some chance you are only just finding me through this little project, well, I must offer you a hearty welcome. Of course, for all of my regular viewers, I do strongly encourage you to uh, continue your learning experience by finding the full Operation Odysseus playlist in the description down below. But enough of that, the time has come to reach our subject, the ship of the line. Titan of pre-industry. That warships during the long 18th century were marvels of technology and construction is not a terribly difficult point to argue. But oftentimes, in order to further demonstrate this point, uh, documentaries and film programs will throw together impressive stock footage of mighty vessels sailing across the open seas, all the while bombarding us with randomly thrown together facts, like how many trees were used to build the ship, or how many miles of rope were used on her, and silly things like that. The intention, of course, is to leave the audience in awe of the magnitude of these vessels. Except, while... Yes, the style is certainly quite impressive, I don't think that it really quite captures the actual incredible scale of these creations within their own context. Yes, it's interesting to us, but what about to the individuals who were alive at the time? Just how impactful were these vessels on their contemporaries, both economically and psychologically? Well, that is precisely what I'm going to be discussing today. Because, sure, while we all know that these ships were big, I don't think that it's terribly common to have a genuine understanding of just how titanic they truly were in every respect. And now to do this, we'll be primarily looking at HMS Victory, uh, uh, mainly because of course the ease of accessing statistics on her, and as well of course because of her striking reputation. While certainly not the largest vessel of her day, uh, nor indeed the most representative, she is most certainly, as the world's oldest commission warship, uh, among the most famous ships to ever set sail, and she will, I think for this reason, serve as a very good reference point for the wider concept being discussed here. Now, I won't be going into too much detail here about the overall ground-up construction of these ships of the line, uh, mainly in the interest of time. Uh, if, however, that process interests you, uh, I will be sure to include a few sources of information in the description down below. And now, just to cover our bases, let's just go over a very brief summary of HMS Victory. His Majesty's ship Victory was first laid down in 1759 and launched in 1765. She's a first-rate ship of the line in the British Royal Navy. You see, the Royal Navy used to categorize its vessels in a uh, rating system, depending on how many guns the ships carried, and uh, the first-rate classification was the largest of these classes. In the Victory's case, she carried 104 guns across three main gun decks and played host to a crew of just over 800 men. While she did miss the Seven Years' War, she did see action in the American War of Independence over in the European theater, and uh, much more famously in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, during which she was Admiral Lord Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, she required some 6,000 trees in her construction, had 27 miles of rigging, 26 miles of line, 2 tons of iron and copper nails, 6,500 square yards of sail, and had a displacement of 3,500 tons. She's over 200 feet tall and cost the government 63,176 pounds at her launch, the equivalent of 50 million pounds today. So again, impressive statistics to be sure, but ultimately meaningless without context. I mean, 
If I had said to you that she had a displacement of 4,000 tons instead of 3,500, or that she was 157 feet high instead of 234, I mean, unless you're very experienced in maritime matters, would you have really known any difference or, or had any other reaction than, wow, that sure is a big number? Because, I mean, I know that I certainly wouldn't have. We live in a world where a 200-foot-high building isn't really too big of a deal, where 50 million pounds is a drop in the bucket of military expenditure. These are interesting statistics, but they're not terribly impactful ones. But to the men and women who saw these vessels rising from the horizon, for whom they were the height of modernity and military strength, well, these statistics were so much more awe-inspiring. So, to sort of start us off, from waterline to mainmast, HMS Victory is 205 feet tall. Portsmouth Cathedral, the tallest building in that city from 1693 all the way until 1969, is 121 feet tall. So when you imagine the victory in her home port, don't just imagine a very tall ship surrounded by other tall ships. Imagine scaling the steps, the countless steps of the cathedral, moving up into the highest of her bell towers. And from the heights, you gaze down at the world below you, at the industrious townspeople going about their daily lives, and the miles and miles of green countryside surrounding you. You feel from this immense height as though you could reach out to the very heavens from that most holy place where only the clouds dare to cast their shadow upon you. The tallest building in the entire city for the last hundred years. But then, you, you turn your gaze out to the waters and you realize that you are in shadow, but it is not a cloud casting that shadow on you. Because towering authoritatively above you, the masts of the great warships, these monolithic constructions of war, they look down upon you, standing higher even than the divine. Now, overly dramatic, I, I know, but I wanted to get across just how magnificently tall the tall ships really were. Because while reading the same statistical height today it may not make it sound too terribly impressive, when you take that statistic within its own context, comparing it to other structures of the time, to other standards of the time, they become, in the mind, so much larger. Another good measure in similar light would perhaps be the cost of these vessels. Again, HMS Victory cost 63,176 pounds, now worth roughly 50 million pounds. But 50 million in a world of aircraft carriers costing billions and billions of pounds, it doesn't really sound like all too much at all, now does it? But it isn't so straightforward as that. You see, historical comparisons of economy aren't as simple as just calculating inflation rates over time. Not only does currency change over time, but of course entire economies do as well. The nature of the economy changes. It becomes more efficient. People grow proportionally wealthier than their ancestors. Purchasing power increases. Now, that could be a whole project all on its own, but suffice to say that while the victory only cost the government £60,000, the entire nation's gross domestic product, meaning effectively the total economic output of the entire country, was at that time only £89 million. The cost of HMS victory was 0.07% of the entire GDP. And perhaps if that figure doesn't completely just blow you away, it also represented a whole percent of the nation's entire defense budget on one ship's construction. So let's compare that maybe to some modern figures to help it make a little bit more sense just how significant that really was. 
The construction of HMS Queen Elizabeth, the nation's new supercarrier and the largest ever ship in the Royal Navy, cost approximately 0.107% of the GDP, if my numbers are correct here. HMS Ark Royal, a light aircraft carrier commissioned in uh, 1985, was about 0.09% of GDP. Going over to the United States, the USS Abraham Lincoln cost about 0.05% of American GDP, and the brand new USS Gerald R. Ford class at a uh, mind-boggling $13 billion to build that ship was about 0.067% of GDP. So, the figures are similar, broadly at least, and it may be safe then to say that the overall economic cost to construct these, the largest ships of the line, being the first rates, well, they were somewhat comparable to the cost of an aircraft carrier to the modern economy. The big difference? Well, there are currently 20 aircraft carriers of all sizes, from supercarriers to light carriers, in the entire world. Comparatively, by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy alone had seven first rates, eight second rates, which were only slightly smaller than the first rates, and, um, oh, oh yes, uh, around 103 third rates, which generally had between 64 and 80 guns across two gun decks. So when you say that the Navy was the wooden wall that defended England from attack, when you say that England spent a lot of money and effort on its Navy, well, you'd better believe it. But perhaps that's not yet enough to give you a proper sense of just how incredible these ships were. So let's talk about their crew for a short time. HMS Victory had a crew of just over 800 men. A big number once again, to be sure. Especially once you consider that the entire population of Portsmouth, the home of the Royal Navy, was in 1801 around 32,000. That means that if the Victory were to come home one day, her entire crew would represent about two and a half percent of the entire town's population. And that's the crew of one ship in Portsmouth. Now, granted, of course, it would never be the case that an entire ship's crew was just let on shore all at once, but still, it gives you a sense of just how large a number of 800 people really was. Far larger, proportionately speaking, than the comparable complement of HMS Queen Elizabeth to Portsmouth's modern city population of 200,000. So again, when they say that these coastal communities were Royal Navy towns, it is in no way an exaggeration. Two and a half percent of the entire town's population made up from the crew of a single vessel. Again, in Portsmouth. And now at last I think we come to the fun piece. Armament. Guns. You see, the firepower of these vessels. And this, I think, is by far the most staggering figure of them all, especially for us uh, students of military history. Now, of course, while sailors and marines on board these ships would have assorted musketry, we all know that those aren't the real meat of a tall ship's firepower. Oh, no, no, no. That would be the cannon. Massive guns that would hurl terrible broadsides of 12, 24, even 32-pound heavy lead round shot into enemy hulls. When we discuss the weight, the shock of these blasts, again, we do so with a sense of awe, but an imperfect one. You see, in order to better understand just how immensely armed and powerful these vessels were, I think it may actually be useful to compare them to armies of the time period. An entire army to one ship. That seems like a good comparison, right? Well, at the Battle of Waterloo, the Allied army under Wellington had a total of 157 guns with his force of 68,000 men. Of these, 60 of those guns were 9-pounder cannon, and the remainder were smaller pieces, you know, 6-pounders, howitzers, and the like. Comparatively, Napoleon, ever the fan of his Grand Battery, uh, commanded 246 pieces of artillery with his army of 73,000. 
and this brings the overall number of cannon at Waterloo to around 403 guns at a field of battle which saw roughly 140,000 men, not including the Prussians who came in later on. Now compare this to HMS Victory, a ship of 800 men. Of course, her armament would have varied over time, but generally, she carried 104 guns. On her own, a single ship, she carried a quarter of the artillery at Waterloo. And that's not all, because while many, even most of the cannon at Waterloo as field pieces were 9-pounder guns or even smaller, the smallest of Victory's guns were 12-pounders. To be exact, she carried 30 32-pound guns, 28 24-pounders, 44 12-pounders, she even had two 68-pounder carronades. But, of course, I, I grant you, Waterloo, while certainly the most famous of Napoleonic battles, was far from the largest, so maybe, in fairness, we're making too much of this little comparison. Well, Let's look at the largest Napoleonic battle, Borodino, which saw Napoleon fight the Russians for control of Moscow. It saw at least 250,000 men engaged, and the total number of artillery pieces deployed was a staggering 1,211 guns. And of course, that well outstrips the 100 guns of the victory. But then, Maybe let's compare battle to battle instead of ship to army, shall we? Because at Trafalgar, Nelson's division, which was made up of about 18 ships and represented half of the Royal Navy force, had a total of 1,066 guns. Nearly as many, half of the Royal Navy, nearly as many guns as the entire Battle of Borodino. And that's not including, as I said, Collingwood's division, where we can add another 1,180 to the count, another Battle of Borodino equivalent. Or, for that matter, the entirety of the French fleet, add another 1,516 guns, more than Borodino. Oh, or, of course, for that matter, the uh, Spanish fleet, add another 1,350 to the count. So if we were to make that comparison, we have, on one side, 1,211 guns at the largest land battle of the Napoleonic Wars, compared with a maximum of 5,112 guns at the Battle of Trafalgar. And on that count, I need say no more. Now, I could probably ramble on about this for hours longer, but I believe uh, uh, that should be sufficient to get my basic point across. And what is that point? Well, not terribly groundbreaking, I know, but ships of the line were large, titanic even, immensely so, and of course, while we all started out with a basic understanding of that, we have that understanding through our modern eyes, a flawed understanding that does not truly capture the magnificence of these creations as their creators would have seen them. The ship of the line was so much more than what we generally conceive of them today. They were the battleships, the super carriers of their era. They were veritable titans of their pre-industrial age, larger than the largest buildings and with greater firepower than the strongest armies. I hope that this video has at least helped to shed a little more light on that. Again, I must thank my supporters on Patreon for their generosity, and of course for choosing this topic of discussion, which I do hope that we've enjoyed, and uh, also of course I must thank the other 16 YouTube channels who make up this collective Operation Odysseus, the link for which you may find in the description down below. And so, of course, we come to a close. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.